everyone and welcome. We are so thrilled to have you all joining us today. Um, my name is Nicola Korsline and I am the founding executive director of the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. As you may have seen as we launched today's program, we have started a whole movement around mentorship for our entrepreneurs in these unprecedented times. Um, if you have not yet heard about mentor makers, we'd love to invite you to join, sign up and find your pathway in support of all those entrepreneurs who are doing amazing things in the world and deserve access to responsive, tactical help now more than ever. We literally have over a thousand people already joined in the movement and we need so many more for our entrepreneurs and for all those doing and building great companies. So we'd encourage you to sign up and find a way to give back and contribute to the great building of great companies uh, now in these times post COVID. None of what we would do at the center would be possible without our incredible thanks and appreciation for all those sponsors who support the work of the center as a nonprofit. So to all of you supporting us from NASDAQ, KPMG, Wilson Sonsini, Lehigh University, Bank of the West, Woodruff Sawyer, BPM, and EDZTE, thank you. We're truly grateful and humbled by all you do for us. Now, I'm going to launch one really quick poll, but before I do, I want to call out, speaking of polling, that we are going to be open for live Q&A at the end of today's session. So as you're hearing from our experts today and you have questions, please go ahead and use that Q&A function that you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen and feel free to let us know what's top of mind. While we don't think we're necessarily going to get to everyone's questions, we want to make this as interactive as possible. And we've got a lot of great content that's going to be coming up. But most importantly, as with everything that the center does, we want it to be useful and relevant for you. And speaking of useful and relevant for you, one of the most important things that we're always pulsing our community on is how you're doing not how your business is doing, not how other things are going on, but how you personally, as an entrepreneur, as a founder are doing. You know, everyone keeps saying these are unprecedented times. And we know that the timeline of these unprecedented times seems to keep unfolding in front of us. So we'd love to get a sentiment read from everyone here today on how you're doing. If you take just a moment to let us know, please know that the information that you share here helps us understand what more resources, counseling, coaching, mentorship, wellness programs we should be unfolding for our entrepreneurs. While we always are known for our responsive programs at a tactical and practical layer, we equally are committed with our program team here to building and bringing forward resources that help you personally be the sustainable entrepreneur you need to be for the businesses that you're building for today and tomorrow. So thank you for all of you taking the time uh, to respond to that poll. Um, we are seeing a, a continued rise in optimism. Um, and many of you that are still uh, finding anxiety and, and honestly just surviving in these times, all understandable and, and really appreciate your honesty and transparency around this. I'm gonna end and just quickly share the results of this. Um, and now um, I am going to be delighted to turn it over to our first amazing partner and panelist on this journey towards understanding venture trends, what's been happening uh, this last quarter, how's it going in general uh, around this year. Um, so please, without any further delay, join me in giving an incredibly warm welcome to our first guest, Craig Sherman. He's our partner at Wilson Sonsini, and he's here today to share incredible insights from their entrepreneurs report. So, Craig, over to you. Thanks so much for joining. Sorry, I, I guess I'm on mute. I do this every single time. Apologies for that. Uh, it's, Nicola, thanks Thanks so much for the, the kind introduction. It's great to be here again. We've been doing these um, seminars on a quarterly basis right now, synced up with a uh, entrepreneur's report that we release on a quarterly basis about deal terms and deal trends in venture financings. I'm gonna go through a couple of highlighted slides, some of the graphs that depict the data from our most recently quarterly survey, which conveniently dropped about two hours ago. And um, we'll be including in the chat a link to the entrepreneur's report so that you can look at the much more detailed data that's provided in the actual report online and on our website so that you can get a good sense of what's happening in the market. And it's really important when you're working potentially on a venture financing and you're talking to investors about terms, 
it's really very, very important to be aware of what's negotiable and what's not negotiable in a venture financing. That there are a lot of terms that seem silly if you haven't done a venture financing before, but if you push back, if you're not being properly advised and you push back on a term that is just market standard, that's gonna be very problematic for you. So you should make sure that you're well informed by looking at our entrepreneurs report and more importantly, by consulting with trusted advisors who worked on venture financings before about the points that are negotiable and there are a lot of key important points that are very much negotiable in a venture financing, but there are a lot of points that just are not negotiable and you need to be well aware of that. So I wanted to dive in and talk a little bit about the current state of the market. And I would uh, say the current state of the market is exuberance. Uh, I don't know if it's irrational or not at this point. Uh, when we get into a little bit more of the numbers here, you, you may conclude that it is irrational at this point, that some of the numbers are, are quite extraordinary. I'll, I'll start with one of the more important um, figures that we look at, the number of up rounds, down rounds, and flat rounds. What that means is when a company is doing its second or later round of financing, is the price per share of that financing going up? Is the company increasing in value? Is the price per share going down? Is the company decreasing in value? Or is the price staying flat? Is it basically reopening the last round, issuing more securities at the same price? And what you can see here in uh, the second quarter of 2021, the number of up rounds hit uh, it was at, I believe, 96%. I don't have the detail numbers, the exact numbers here, but I believe it's 96%, which is the highest that we've ever recorded. So companies that are raising money and lots of companies are raising money right now, for the most part, are able to increase their valuation. Why don't we jump to the next slide? which will illustrate this even more. I have not seen a lot of graphs in my life that have gone up and to the right this much. Uh, this is the median pre-money valuation of financings where our firm was involved either as company counsel or as investor counsel. Um, this is kind of a split chart on the left side. We're looking at the full years, 2016, 17, 18, 19, and 20. And then on the right side of the chart, we're looking on a quarterly basis starting in the first quarter of 2019. And you can see that we're, we're looking at um, median pre-money valuations for seed financing, Series A financings, Series B financings, and Series C and later. And what's particularly extraordinary here is the median pre-money valuation for a Series C or later financing, it hit one billion dollars. If you look back just to the first quarter of 2019, so two years ago, we were at 200 million pre-money valuation. So in just two years, the the median pre-money valuation of late stage financings has gone up 5x. If you go back to full year 2016, we were at uh, 89.1 million dollar median pre-money valuation. So we've gone up about 11X in five years. Um, I, do, I don't know whether this is sustainable or not. I, I doubt that we're gonna continue to see the same expo nearly exponential growth that we have, but the uh, you can see that these numbers here are, are extraordinary and valuations are very, very good. It's never been a better time to raise money than right now. Why don't we jump to the next slide? The median amounts raised, you can see that there are lots of dollars available right now. Since the Fed started pumping money into the economy, uh, the size of transactions has increased dramatically, uh, particularly Series B and Series C and later. And now we didn't set records in this quarter, but we're pretty close to record levels for the late stage financings, the amount of being raised. And Series A financings, uh, we did hit a record uh, 12 and a half million pre-money valuation. So uh, again, it's, it's never been easier to raise money at a higher valuation 
and it's never been easier to raise more money. I think the theme go actually going back for a couple of years now, and it's just increased every quarter has been, if you are able to raise money, you are able to raise money, uh, more money than you wanted and at a higher valuation than you may have rationally expected. Why don't we jump to the next slide? And finally, we also track terms of bridge loans, which are um, unpriced financing. So it's not a priced equity financing. These are, um, uh, are uh, unpriced rounds either before the first priced equity financing for a, an early stage company or in between um, rounds for a company, typically an inside round where the company wants to raise some more cash before going out and raising uh, a next equity round at a higher valuation. And you can see again, very healthy numbers here. The, the one interesting note here is that the median amount raised in pre-seed financing, so before a first price round, actually dropped pretty meaningfully. And, and I, I'm not gonna be presenting the data here, but I've seen data from other sources and from my own personal experience and the experience of my partners. We've seen that the number of seed financing since the pandemic started uh, has dropped. There have been fewer seed financings and they've often been, been um, uh, smaller financings than in the past. You know, the, the real concentration of activity has been later stage, bigger rounds rather than earlier stage. So that's the one sobering note here is that, and, and hopefully a trend that will change. I suspect personally that this has a lot to do with, you know, not being able to meet in person. Normally the way that the earliest stage financings get done, these uh, pre-seed financings and seed financings get done is by personal interaction. And we've been seeing uh, fewer of those financings since it's been very difficult for people to meet in person. So that's kind of the high level uh, state of the market. Incredible data as always, Greg. Thank you so much for giving us the highlights. Lots to dig into. And on that note, of course, um, it's my great honor to introduce and welcome YB Choi today from Vulcan Capital. Um, before we get started with the official questions and kind of digging into a lot of this content, I'd love to invite actually both of you maybe to take just a moment and share a little bit about your background and kind of an overview YB on the firm. And then Craig, a little bit about your work that you do at Wilson on a day by day basis above and beyond just presenting amazing charts and information that's very convoluted to, to, to digest on a general day. But YB, maybe we can start with you. Great. Thank you, Nicole. Great. And great to meet everyone here. Um, very happy that you all are uh, kind of honoring us by taking time out of your valuable days to, to hear what I hope is interesting stuff. Uh, I'll give a quick overview in, in terms of who I am at and Vulcan Capital. So I am partner leading venture capital investing at Vulcan Capital, which is the investment management arm of Vulcan Inc. The organization started by the late co-founder of Microsoft, Paul Allen, back in the late 80s. Um, and so I've been here at Vulcan Capital since 2008. So going on 14 years now uh, in terms of doing early stage venture. And as you all are probably acutely aware of at this point, it takes a long time to get a report card in this in this area of investment, but but so far so good for us here. Um, I've been focused on early stage investing the whole time. So that for us means entering deals at a seed or a series A, though we're not limited to those entry points that's just kind of most common. Uh, we also have entered deals at, at later stages with larger check sizes. And that speaks to kind of how we, we operate, um, invest mostly across the US, um, some in, in beyond and international. We have an office in Singapore doing early stage investing in Southeast Asia. We've done investments in Europe, though not, not proactively at this point yet. But you know, over the course of my time here, we've done probably 70 plus uh, investments into or have 70 plus portfolio companies um, and, and across all different industries and, and verticals, just because that was what Paul's legacy was for us, was just investing in core tech innovation everywhere it's happening. It's a great philosophy. Thank you so much for being here, YB. Craig, over to you. Great. Thanks, Nicola. So I've been, uh, I'm Craig Sherman. I've been practicing law for almost exactly 32 years. I think I took the bar exam 32 years and two weeks ago uh, been, and, and then got married right after, but happily with my wife now for 32 years and our anniversary <laughs> is tomorrow, uh, yeah. but we're going out to dinner tonight. <laughs> uh, and I started my practice working on, on Wall Street with a big Wall Street firm 
working on big multi-billion dollar oil and gas deals, which I kind of enjoyed. But then I moved out to Seattle about 27 years ago and started working with early stage tech companies and just fell in love that uh, working with entrepreneurs and helping them really achieve their dreams and their passions. And to me, it's much more meaningful to work with three or four founders who are starting a brand new company uh, and have a brand new idea and work with them to help build the company from the ground up. Uh, For me, I get a lot more personal satisfaction out of helping the founders grow a company than working with a multi-trillion dollar oil and gas company do a billion dollar financing. So um, it's, it's been a great rewarding career. I am the co-chair of our emerging companies practice firm wide um, and work with companies from the very earliest stage from a handful of people starting a startup up to, uh, you know, through venture financings, have worked with many companies on their IPOs over the years that I had incorporated uh, these days doing a lot of de-SPAC transactions, although that's slowing down a little bit. The SPAC market seems to have sobered up a bit. So uh, not as many of those, but still actively doing quite a few of those transactions. Uh, what we're seeing a lot of right now is those transactions I was talking about earlier, the, the billion dollar plus valuation, late stage private finance things. Uh, every time I turn around, uh, another client seems to be getting a term sheet to raise 100 to $200 million. So yeah, uh, it's been a it's a, it's a great time to be an entrepreneur, particularly sadly a later stage entrepreneur. But hopefully, uh, the early stage market market is really going to get going again soon as well. It's amazing, and yes, we're going to have to come back to that. Maybe maybe I'll go a bit off script and, and get some of your temperature checks around the earlier stage deals that you're seeing right now. Um, but before we do that, Craig, I, I want to start with you. Obviously, there are many different axes that we could plot when it comes to like where do entrepreneurs wish things were and and what's actually going on in different quads. One of the ones is often speed of getting the deal done, right? Like so, there's the amount of money, there's the valuation, and then there's how long is it actually taking to do. Obviously, from what you're seeing right now, can you give me a bit of a, a, a sense of to how long these deals are actually taking to come together? And is there, a, is there a consolidation of that timeline that's benefiting entrepreneurs or on the capital allocator side too? Yeah, no, I, it's a great question. And I would say the speed to getting a deal done is tied very closely to overall market conditions and how competitive the market is, how many dollars are floating out and trying to find a place to land. Um, I have not seen deals move more quickly uh, since late 1999, kind of the peak market. And, and sometimes I worry that the, the faster deals are getting done and the less diligence is being done, uh, that's a, it's gotta be a sign of a peak market that people maybe aren't doing as much diligence as they ought to be doing. Um, particularly for late stage financings, our experience has been that companies are talking, starting conversations with investors and often have a term sheet or competing term sheets within two to three weeks. And finance, we've seen financings close as quickly as two to three weeks after a signed term sheet, which is extraordinary. I mean, it, the normal process to get from first meetings to term sheet would more typically be one to three months. And then the time from a signed term sheet to a closing would typically be four to six weeks. But we're, we're in this extraordinary period where Deals are getting done very, very quickly. Diligence is is getting done very, very quickly. So um, particularly for the later stage deals, my experience has been it's, I I haven't seen a a more entrepreneurial friendly climate uh, for deal terms and for speed to closing and and certainty of closing because there there are very few deals that, uh, that are starting up right now that aren't closing. And apologies for the drill in the background. We're doing some house renovations. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I'll go close the door. <laughs> it's not a word. Uh, every every moment is always a fun one when we're when we're in these Zoom settings for sure. Um, well, Webby, I want to I want to flip it a little bit to the to the capital side of the house, kind of piggybacking a little bit of what Craig was sharing. I'd be curious when you're advising your existing portfolio companies right now, what's the general advice that's kind of going out around when is the right time for them to be thinking about fundraising, and then you know maybe starting a little bit of that earlier stage uh, conversation happening around that first round coming in, what is your general philosophy or advice that you're mentoring companies on about how long it might take them and what the strategy is they should be applying when it comes to raising that first round of capital? 
Sure. Yeah, absolutely. The, there's a couple of different ways of answering that. I think that the latter part for maybe first or, or second early in financing is in the second of an existing company where it, how do you sort of set expectations of when you should start thinking about firms. The, the two buckets it kind of typically falls into for fundraising is, is one, when you need it, um, and, and you kind of don't want to be that market. And, and two is when you feel like you have the right profile, you have the right sort of uh, situation or, or setup to, to successfully fundraise. Ideally, you're in that second camp where, where you are able to fundraise kind of at, at your pace and, and have a little bit more leverage in the, in the, in the process. But in terms of timing wise, it is at particularly an early stage venture, the, you know, the, the most important metric is always going to be cash and runway. And so you should always be, that should be a number that entrepreneurs know every single day um, and, and, and have a good idea of, of how long runway is. And, and, and so that always is going to factor into saying, okay, when you should be, be able to work back from that and, and say when you should be thinking about fundraising, when you should be in market, how long you should expect to, it to take. And the, the rule of thumb, of course, Although notwithstanding all the comments Craig just made about things happening just a lot faster, if you are lucky to be in that camp and, and it is still somewhat a haves and have nots kind of dynamic going on is, is, is gotta be a lot earlier than you think. It, it always takes much longer. I think there's always the, the situation where founders go or entrepreneurs go out with perfect timing in mind, which is we'll go out, it'll take us three months to raise and we'll, from start of fundraising to close and, and then we'll be fine. And look, it happens to line up exactly with when we run out of cash. If you do that, it's a disaster. You've got to, you've got to start it as soon as, as soon as you can, right? But, but the, to your point, you've got to strategize that well and know what it takes and, and, and not just go out and say, well, we need money. So let's just build a deck on, on whatever we look like now and start pitching. You've got to have that plan of, of what you're pitching, both from um, what, what the content company and the productions are, but also even within that fundraising process, do you have catalysts in there as well that will push that fundraise process along, right? Are there, is there a customer win that you're expecting? Are there other kind of news or events or product releases that you have that you filter into that fundraise process to keep that momentum going because, because it's a slog and, and it's a grind and you need to be aware of that. And the other part of strategizing, I would say, is to be very thoughtful early on about the universe of investors that you're going to and be very methodical in doing that as well, because you don't want to be doing that piecemeal as well, because the, the worst thing you can happen in, in your fundraising is you lose momentum and it's very hard to, to build that back up. Really, really sage advice. And I, I want to go back a little bit to, to, you know, pre this remarkable environment that we find ourselves in, it was not uncommon that most entrepreneurs were raising with an indication of knowing they needed at least 12 months. In fact, at the, the, the start of the COVID, there were some that were saying, unless you had 18 months of runway ahead of you, you were really in a dangerous and, and precarious situation. Given how much valuations and the capital markets have just opened right now, are you seeing shorter runways being raised and, and or are you noticing a differential when the next fundraising event is expected uh, with portfolio companies? Or Craig, maybe you can kind of anecdotally answer this question from the deals that you're seeing getting done right now. My experience has been, I'm curious what, what YB's thoughts on this, but my experience has been that most companies are raising more money than they need and extending out their runway. And I think the smarter companies are raising more money than they need. And unlike in 1999, they're not planning to spend it all right away. Because the experience in 1999 was people thought the world had changed and there were no longer market cycles and you could raise money every six months. And I had a lot of clients that in 1999 had an expectation that money was free and you know, we'll, we'll do this round and Six months from now, we'll raise uh, more money and we'll be out of money at that point, but we'll raise, it'll be really easy to raise more money at a big step up in valuation. And a lot of companies ended up just hitting the wall and dying. I mean, it, right when the market crashed in April of 2000, a lot of companies just simply ran out of business and shut the doors and walked away. And I feel good that I'm seeing companies raise money and keep it in the bank and, and, be conservative knowing that it is possible to raise money. And, you know, honestly, a lot of companies are raising money more frequently than they expected. I have quite a few clients that raised money six months ago and are raising money again now because they can and because their terms are good. I have a, a client that's actually being acquired right now in a fabulous deal. And they still have, they had done a series A, a series B, series C. They still have series A money in the bank. 
and they're now being acquired in a deal where everyone's going to make a lot of money. It's a, it's a fabulous deal, but they, they raised the series B and series C because they got inbound calls from top tier investors saying, I know you're not raising money right now. And I know you don't need to raise money, but please take some of our money. So I, I say that the smart, smart founders, smart entrepreneurs are raising as much money as they can right now. And, Squirreling it away under the tree. That YB, is, I don't know what your what your yeah, thoughts I are there. Yeah, I was going to say, YB, would love your would love your thoughts on that. It's great to know we're not on that hamster wheel of like the never ending fundraising cycles for for founders for sure. But YB, what are you what are you seeing out there? Yeah, I will say I'll kind of go back to what I alluded to before about the it being a little bit of a barbell of, of haves and have nots, and, and you, it's not fun to be in the have nots. But in the haves, it definitely is, as Craig was saying, where you you go out, companies are going out with a target and quickly exceeding that because there's more demand and being able to be a squirrel away a lot of capital and extend the runway out and have a lot more buffer into it. There's also the category I think a little bit more of what you alluded to of of either pulling in the runway because of the frothy environment to say, no, let's just raise what we need to get to this next round. And then that round is going to be amazing because as, as you saw on, on Craig's charts, as you get later, the, the valuation acceleration is just, it's wild. And that the capital at later rounds, although it's all seeping down earlier and earlier, there's, there's more available. And so folks are also doing that. And that's risky, you know, as, as Craig mentioned, that it's, it's a very risky bet to do that because entrepreneurs are taking the tack of, well, let's just bet on ourselves. We'll get there and then, and then not need to take this much dilution up front here. Uh, and so you are seeing some of that in a kind of either out of necessity sometimes, but other times out of, I guess, could be viewed as, as sort of short-term thinking uh, in, in terms of, of optimizing for not taking a lot of dilution right now at the, at the risk of not having enough capital. Yeah, yeah. Well, YB, I want to stay with you on the, um, I hate calling it this, but it's it's a fair statement, the have-nots, at least as we think about extending maybe a little bit of social capital and support for those that may not have that network of access to direct funders. You obviously get a lot of inbound deal flow heading your way and a lot of inbound requests. What are some strategies or tips that you've seen that have worked really well for founders connecting with um new funds that they may not have a previous relationship with to really try to find out if this is a good fit for raising funding from them. Yeah, I will say the, the cliched advice that everyone gives is get a warm intro is tried and true is you've, you've got to find a way to get introduced via, via a warm introduction. And I'm not saying that because we're all a bunch of jerks, even though we are, that, that don't take cold uh, inbounds. It, it's just time. Right. And, and I, I won't say it. I haven't responded to sort of cold inbounds, whether it was from whatever channel, email, LinkedIn before, but that's you're really taking a shot in the dark. So it's not that we don't want to, you just don't have the time. And so we're, it's kind of a, a shortcut from from our side of the table to just be able to filter things that that, that kind of rise up in priority. So that's that's one. I, I would also note that within that, you know, obviously, priority number one is find a way to get warm intros. But two, if you can do it when you're not fundraising or not absolutely needing to right that that also high, high, or raises the bar of do I respond or up because that means I know I'm engaged immediately into an investor pitch and I've got do I have the time and resource to evaluate this right now try to get connected earlier just almost as an informational hey this company's doing something cool do you want to meet with them hear about them talk them and just let a, an investor connect the dots and then now you can go back to that investor whenever you're ready to fundraise and you don't need that intro and it's it's some more lower pressure intro than it is to, to try to just be right in the middle of a, a fundraise and then trying to get connected to everybody and everybody. Very smart, very smart. And I love the reverse engineering strategy, really good. Um, you know, Craig, I, I know this isn't exactly in sort of anything we're gonna find in a, well, never say never it's not in the current venture report but you know, one of the things that often comes up in conversation with entrepreneurs rightfully so is a fear of how much information do i share certainly early on in venture conversations um and especially in our high-tech deals where there's obviously a lot of ip uncertainty around how much is released what general guidance or thoughts do you offer for our founders who may be a little uh, worried about how much to share and how much not to share and 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 where to protect where to draw that line for themselves and for their company yeah, it's, it's a great question because I, I think most entrepreneurs assume when well, investors just going to sign a non-disclosure agreement and we're going to use a standard non-disclosure agreement and we're going to go walk up and down Sand Hill Road, handing out NDAs and talking to anybody who's willing to sign an NDA. And the reality is that, for, frankly, for understandable reasons, venture capitalists will not 
normally sign a non-disclosure agreement. So what that means is you need to get a VC's interest. You know, the first part is YB was talking about is getting getting a meeting because most VCs are receiving hundreds, if not thousands of reach outs per year. So they have to filter the number of companies that they'll even have an initial conversation with. But when you have that initial conversation, you need to understand with a VC, it's not gonna be under a non-disclosure agreement. Number one, ideally you've got a relationship because this is based on trust and, and uh, you know, venture capital still works the old fashioned way where it's all about personal relationships. VCs who steal ideas from uh, entrepreneurs are going to get a bad reputation. So make sure you understand that you've, you've been well connected to that investor and you understand the investor um, because your, your, um, uh, you, they can, in theory, take advantage of the information that you're learning and then limit the information. It's kind of people talk about the old cliche, you know, peeling back the layers of the onion, um, you know, disclose enough information that you get the inf investor interested early, but don't, um, uh, don't give away the jewels, you know, don't give away the technological details. Certainly if you filed a patent, uh, you can't be disclosing information that's in a patent that's not yet issued because you don't want to taint your patent application. So be very careful about the information that you're disclosing to an investor. Now, this is different with angel investors. Angel investors often will be willing to sign a non-disclosure agreement. So you can feel a little bit more comfortable, but whether you have an NDA or not, you know, the contract is less important than it, from my perspective, than the relationship of trust that you have with the person that you're talking to. And someone may sign an NDA and breach that non-disclosure uh, agreement that they've signed with you. Um, a, my experience with VCs has not been, I, I've, in the 25 years that I've been working on venture deals or 27, I, I can't think of a situation where a reputable VC talked to an entrepreneur and used information that they learned from talking to an entrepreneur in a, in a nefarious way. But, but be cautious. Yeah, yeah, sage advice. And, and I think, you know, one of the elements that often comes up in that, again, is realizing some things can be asked for that can slow or feel um, disingenuous to the conversation that's unfolding with investors. Now, YB, on, on, on a similar vein, you know, to, to see where deals sometimes get stalled, if you will, to take us a little bit behind the inside conversations that may be happening uh, when the entrepreneur leaves the room, where do you see often deals potentially fall down or, or, or maybe get slowed down, maybe not completely stalled, but slowed down? Um, and, and what advice would you give entrepreneurs um, around cautionary words of wisdom to avoid those types of situations? Sure. Yeah, I think that's that's a great topic to talk about, and also one that's that is, you could talk for a long time on. But I'll try to try to try to think about what what's important to, to talk about here and, and briefly. It, where where it, there's two points. It obviously I'll, I'll talk more to where does sort of negotiations kind of bog down once you're post term sheet or or negotiating the term sheet. Not so much leading up to even trying to get that because that's a whole other can of worms of, of how do you even just get your process to coalesce into a getting terms from somebody. But post-term sheet, you know, probably what I see most often, and it goes, it cuts both ways, right? And from an investor's point of view, I've seen investors do this as well, but, but a lot on founder side is just getting worked up or caught up around terms that maybe aren't in, in the bigger picture that important. And that happens for a lot of different reasons. One may be just, you know, what I, what I always hate is, is, is a lot of the, the, the blog posts and the stuff that you can find on the internet is just, it's not really generally applicable and not meant to be, but people read it as if that should, this is how it should work every single time. And so I should be really concerned about whatever this, you know, term X, Y, and Z. But the best thing a founder can do is really know what the terms mean and why, what practical impacts they have, both in terms of the current deal and what it'll have down the road and really have your own opinion about, do you care about that? Because too often the where it gets bogged down is just, taking counsel's advice or taking someone else's advice about what should be important. And then just being hung up on that because of that advice, as opposed to really knowing, do I really even care about that, that term or not? And, and that, that's why I say it cuts both ways because sometimes investors do that as well. And just, it becomes this weird battle of, of, I just really care about that term because we're negotiating here. And that's never a good thing because to Craig's point, this is a little different, right? This is not, 
a one-time deal. You, you're kind of getting married to, uh, you know, there's a marriage happening here and this is a relationship that you really want to build. And so that's one thing I will say is pay attention to behavior during that process too, because that that behavior is going to kind of surface again. And so know the terms, know if you really care about them and take a bigger picture view to it, right? Trying to argue for another, you know, 500k evaluation do you really care that much it, it, depending on what i mean obviously if that's only around you're going to raise maybe you do but if you're going to be out raising series f series g a lot of dilution a lot of things are going to happen and, and you can make can gain value uh, the last point i will add again with the recurring theme of know who your investors are know who you're partnering with sometimes it bogs down because of the other investors in your in your syndicate and and they are putting pressure on founders about, hey, no, don't take those terms or, or, or kind of being in it. So again, know, know what you care about and be able to stand your ground, but also be careful who you're getting in bed with because I've had kind of disruptive investors in the syndicate kind of being trying to hand their way into negotiations and, 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 and kind of push their own agendas. And that is not at all helpful for founders either. Wendy, I'm going to stay with you just for a minute because there's a lot that often comes up of uncertainty around that whole syndication landscape and, um, you know, the appropriate ways in which to identify a lead or sort of move a lot of soft circled interest into a position of closing. How do you help entrepreneurs sort of think through that overarching strategy? And, and do you advise them to just flat out ask VCs, will you lead this round? If, if, there's, if, they're, if they generally seemed interested and they're sort of dancing around the issue, how to sort of get that lead investor to really take and own the process? Yeah, no, that's, it's, it's a tough one and there is no good answer. And it's a, it's a very tough dance because, you know, investors, and this is what, you know, especially first time founders, that's a lot of advice we typically have to give because first time founders believe everybody at their word and, and investors are always saying, this is really interesting. I'm going to talk to my partner, like, you know, keep me in mind. And, and, and then they come, the, you know, the founder comes back and says, I have 10 firms that are, that are probably going to write terms. It's like, everybody says that because they don't know yet, but they also don't want you to, to cross them off the list. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I think founders, the, you know, the good ones can, can be so straightforward and just say, hey, are you late for this? Does this seem like something you would lead and get an answer? You know, again, you're only as good as whatever the VC or the associate's word is going to be. You know, one thing I will say specifically, and, and I won't, I'll, I'll say it just because I don't think we're unique in this, is for us in, in the seed stage part of it, at least, we're more than happy to commit to a, a round before a, a lead is there or our terms. And so we'll say, hey, we'll put 500K into your seed raise. Just let us know when you have terms. Obviously, we, we if they're crazy, we can back out, but otherwise, and that really helps catalyze around it. If someone has, cause that's, I mean, that is the, the well-deserved right criticism of, of herd behavior from investors, which is like, everybody just stands around until somebody does something. And so for, you know, if you can find investors who are willing to do that and put that kind of commitment, just to sort of start to catalyze something. Um, otherwise I would go back to what I said about strategizing your fundraise of being very thoughtful about the, the groups and subsets and segments of investors you're going to, so that you give yourself your best shot and you maintain momentum. You don't want to kind of deplete your, your very highly curated list of six and they say, oh, great, now what do we do? Like you want to be, be in, in conversations and also create continued sort of urgency in the process, which doesn't mean false urgency. That's something I definitely want to call out as founders don't read that one blog post that says, hey, create <laughs> urgency in your process and then go telling everybody, hey, you have to decide by Friday when even though that's not a, a, a deadline at all because that actually works against you and, and, and is not helpful to your cause, but do something that, that makes it, whether it's you have sort of milestones coming up that you want to get fundraising ahead of, or you have something to, to say, or even again, and going back to the scenario of, of you not needing to fundraise to say, you know what, actually, maybe we're not going to raise right now, or maybe we'll just do a note with our insiders just to give urgency to the process that says, hey, this opportunity isn't forever. You don't get to do diligence for six months here while I you know, wait to see if you come to, come to uh, conviction on it. No, really, really good advice there, YB. Thank you so much. And again, I think it's one of those things that people aren't quite sure how do I ask the question. So really appreciate the transparency around that and the catalytic ideas on, on, on how to get a movement happening in a very difficult, challenging situation for a lot of founders. Um, Craig, YB touched a lot on sort of know really what's behind the terms and, and know the terms that matter to you personally as entrepreneurs going through the process. Generally speaking, as you've looked across this really interesting landscape unfolding in real time, are there terms that are changing? Are there terms you know, for our series AB uh, companies that are, have kind of gone out the window right now just because like 
you know, speed is taking over from a lot of that diligence. Like we kind of, well, not fair to say a lot of the diligence, but, but speed is becoming a lot faster. So are there terms that are going away as a result or negotiations that are just changing in, in, in mindset? Yeah, I, I would say for earlier stage deals, for series C deals, a first price equity round, series A, series B, deal terms have been very company favorable for a number of years and have been very steady. You know, a liquidation preference is normally the investors get their money back and then they don't get a positive return unless they convert into common, what's called the non-participating preferred. And that's been very market for a number of years because we, we've had a very favorable environment for quite a few years now. And those terms have been very steady. I'd say it's in the later stage rounds where investors have been more accommodating than they have been in the past and the terms have become more company favorable than they were historically. And a lot of the areas where that comes in are areas of control that typically in a normal, steady, stable environment, late stage investors coming into a round where they're writing a $100 million check into a company that may have raised only 30 or 40 million to date in a series C to series A and series B in the aggregate. So they're writing a much bigger check than the earlier investors at a much higher valuation. Normally they would insist on having certain deal protections, most importantly voting, that they would insist on having um, series uh, uh, protections, protective provisions where you can't sell the company or you can't do a next round financing without the consent of this new investor because they've written by far the biggest check. And even though uh, they're, they're writing the big check, their ownership percentage is relatively low because they're investing at such a high valuation. Historically, they would still say, hey, we wrote the biggest check, biggest valuation. We need to be protected. We need to be able to have these blocking rights. And we also need to have anti-dilution protection. We need to have blocking rights on an IPO if the valuation is not high enough if there's not an increase in valuation and if the IPO is not on uh, if it's at a lower valuation we should get additional shares we should be uh, compensated for the reduction in the valuation if the IPO ends up being a mediocre IPO those are the types of deal protections that we were seeing three four five years ago and would be very typical and we're now in such a hot environment that investors are willing to write these very big checks with no meaningful protection for their investment. So they typically are not having, not, not in all cases, but in many cases, companies have the leverage to say, you're writing a check, you're not getting a board seat, you're not getting any separate pro protective provisions, you're writing us a really big check and getting a relatively small percentage of the company and you're along for the ride. So I, again, it goes to, what I talked about at the beginning, that the terms for late stage financings have never been better, but even for the earlier stage financings, terms are steady, but, but very company, very founder friendly right now. Mm -hmm. Really, really interesting. Um, okay, I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna do one more general question that I'm gonna ask for final takeaways. And then we're gonna go into uh, the great questions that the audience have been submitting and, uh, and submitted in advance. Thank you to everyone participating. Now is a great time. Uh, PSA moment to pop those questions into the Q&A if you do have something that you want to ask YB and Craig today. Um, but let me first get both of your takes a little bit. Right now in this moment, if you think back over the last few weeks and the deals that you've been evaluating or counseling, what are you generally saying right now pay most attention to as an entrepreneur? So either YB, when they're coming in and pitching, what are you listening or looking for as indications of a good deal? And Craig, similarly, if you're counseling clients right now, what are you saying? Be ready to answer or be thoughtful of when they're going into investor meetings. YB, can we start with you? Sure. To it, it, It's pointed there to talk about kind of right here, right now, as opposed to general, it would have been easier for it to just speak generally, but but to, to really think about right now, what's what's kind of top of mind. It's an interesting point in time. And, 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 and I would say Besides all the typical things, right, in terms of that we'll really look to to hone in on and when we're talking to entrepreneurs, whether it's the team and the product and all that things, right now is is a very good time. And I, I, won't, I won't call it, go so far as to call it a requirement that you get dinged if you don't have this, but it is to your advantage if you have a very pointed view on what is happening right now, right? If And, and I say that because we've all seen, we've all lived through 
and continue to live through uh, what, what is going on both with COVID and all over the world. And so to have a very pointed opinion and, and, and know and have a vision about what the future will look like, whether it's something even as basic as, look, does the e-commerce trend stick? Like, have we, have we gotten over the, bu- the bump on, on the hump on e-commerce and is now just a permanent muscle memory change, right? Or is, does work from home or whatever that may be to, to have that part of it, because you can't avoid that part of the conversation, right? You cannot come in and pitch and just say, here, here's how we look. This is our forecast. This is the, how we're going to do in the next couple of years, because you need to have some sort of a narrative about what either you're either leaning into or what sustain, what trend sustains that, that helps you or, or what you think changes or, or anything like that. And so you have that point of view and that filters into a lot of different things, whether, you know, how you've done your financial projections, what kind of assumptions underlie that, what you've done for your product and all those things. And so that I would say kind of point in time right now is, is, is really important because I mean, we're seeing it in our portfolio as well. We've seen companies that have caught a tailwind and even those we, we are digging in just to say, is this permanent? Is this transitory? What, what's going to be the, you know, what is this company going to look like two years from now as opposed to two months from now? Thank you, Ivy. Really helpful. Craig, what about your side? Yeah, I, I would say the, the same, that, that it's, um, you know, be, be aware of the market terms. We've been talking a lot about market terms, you know, valuations, and, and, and it's important to be mindful of the terms at any time. And, and, these these are appear to be giddy times, but they're not giddy times for everybody. And YB, I think appropriately early on said, hey, Craig talked about all these great terms and huge valuations, but that's for a relatively small group. Not everybody is is getting these huge valuations and finding it super easy to raise money. It is really, really hard to raise money. So go into it with real, realistic expectations, notwithstanding anything you 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 seen today on a chart that I presented or any other charts that you, you see online, it's still really, really hard to raise money. So be humble going in. And, and my other advice would be, uh, notwithstanding the market conditions, whether it's great market conditions generally as it is now or difficult market conditions in the future, when you're going into these investor meetings, it's really important to be thinking about building relationships. Uh, you know, Where venture back companies typically fail is not because there's not a product market fit, um, or uh, because um, uh, you know you weren't weren't able to generate the revenues you expected to raise, or you you ran out of money. I mean, normally you're running out of money for some other reason uh, than perhaps bad planning. But companies tend to fail because people don't get along, and whether it's founders among themselves as a group, or more importantly, founders and investors not getting along, that's just that's the end of your company. If if you haven't built a relationship with your investors and your investors are unhappy with you, you're probably going to end up having to leave even if your investors own less than half the company uh, or more, even if your investors yeah, don't own a, a controlling stake in the company. Um, and you're not going to be able to raise money again if your investors don't support you. So you've got to really foster that positive relationship with your investors so that you function as a team and you've got to determine that early on you know the investors doing diligence on you yb referred to this earlier you need to do in, 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 diligence on your investor and really make sure that this is somebody you're going to be happy working with for the next 5 10 15 20 years due diligence is a two way street and it is a long and lengthy relationship and hopefully a fruitful and great one along the way but one that needs to sustain both good times and bad for sure. Um, So uh, along that note, we always like to end before opening up to Q&A with kind of a final takeaway. So not to put you on the spot, but I'm putting you on the spot. What's like (laughs) one last takeaway that both of you would want to make sure the audience had from your perspectives around this conversation today? Um, Webby, can we start with you and then Craig will move over. Sure. Uh, you know, one thing I would say that's it's been helpful for founders to keep in mind is 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 kind of the overall nature of of the game, right? And it and it varies, right? Depending on if you, what kind of company you're building. If you're building something to just be a cash flow generating uh, machine, then that's that's different. But in this name of the game, particularly early stage investing, you've got to understand that an early stage fundraising means that you're going to also raise mid and late stage fundraising. Once you start, I mean, you can't stop. That's, that's, I mean, that's a different topic of be careful when you, when you jump on this treadmill. 
Uh, but know that going in, right? And be be comfortable with that risk. And that's something you see founders not do is, is know that having a runway and a cliff, a cash cliff, that's okay. You have to get comfortable with that. And you have to be able to know that you, you have to run towards that cliff. You have to push your business. You have to take this risk. And everybody else, we're all big, big people, you know, growing ups around the table. We understand this as well. Failure is not that I mean, we're used to that's that's fine, um, but but it's kind of my way of saying you've kind of got to embrace the risk and you've got to do that, or else you will not get where you're trying to go, and instead you'll get bogged down to kind of staying in the middle and and taking it, playing the safe route, and you won't be able to fundraise, and you may not get there. Um, just know that that's what this all this all revolves around, and everybody around understands that there's risk involved, and so don't take it as oh, I, now that I've raised money from you, I can't lose this. I promise I'll give it back to you. It's like no, we're here for you to burn it up, and but it makes something bigger as you go. Love that. Craig? Yeah, so I, I guess my, my, my final takeaway would be an extension of what I was talking about earlier on building relationships. It's, you're not going to build a relationship if you don't establish trust by demonstrating that you are worthy of trust in interacting with your investors. And it's, it's a hard balance to strike because you're an entrepreneur. You've you, you, you got to be a little bit crazy to take the risk to start your own company. And you've got to be optimistic and truly believe that your companies are going to be successful and you got to sell a little bit ahead of the curve, but you got to strike this balance of not overselling and not undermining your credibility long run. And if you go into the meetings and you promise things in initial meetings with investors that you're not going to be able to deliver and there's no reason, you know, you're just overinflating and being overly positive, you're going to be completely undermined in building that long-term relationship. So, um, be optimistic, be positive, be cheery, but don't oversell and overhype because it really is counterproductive long-term. Credibility is critical at every juncture, for sure. Thanks, Craig, for those for those very important words and reminders for us all. All right, I'm going to get really interested really quickly and launch a poll in front of everyone. Um, the reason that I'm doing this before we transition to Q&A is really twofold. As a reminder, everything that the center builds is based on what you need us to build. So we don't have a one-size-fits-all approach to uh, entrepreneurial programs. Craig and YB are here in support of the report that's come out, absolutely, but also because we know from our entrepreneurs they need insights around venture and financing and the trends that are affecting them in this market right now. And so Craig and others have been kind to sort of show up with that information in hand to help you be successful at building the companies that you're inspiring us towards. So to that end, the information on this screen is going to help us look ahead for the next six to eight weeks and bring forward programs that can help you do more and go further uh, without hopefully diluting you in the process. So everything, as you know, that the center does is free pro bono. We just ask that you pay it forward and help other entrepreneurs. So please let us know what you need us to be building. And we promise we'll show up with this information and this support. And thank you in advance for all that you're doing for us in this process as well. Um, I'm going to end the poll really quickly and share the results. Not surprisingly, we are continuing to see finance and sales be two of the top drivers. And also just understanding some of the continuations of the challenges of building and, and surviving the team environment right now. So stay tuned for more programs there. And we will be uh, coming back to you shortly with those opportunities to learn and grow with us and beside us in that journey. All right, let's get to the heart of the questions that have been coming in. And we're going to do this lightning round because I know time is running out. So Craig, I'm going to hit you up to start with. Um, people would love to understand, is there any delineation by breakdown on industry right now? Are you seeing certain sectors that are really outperforming other sectors? Can you give us a bit of that analysis quickly in the data that you covered? Yeah, I mean, we actually do track the data by industry, um, but internally, we, we don't publish it in the report. Um, the, the areas that have been super hot, I think, are the ones that, that people are, aware, are well aware of. Enterprise software is, is super hot. Uh, gaming is super hot. Um, uh, let me think what else. E-commerce e has been very hot. Anything electric has been super hot. Energy has been super hot. Life science is doing pretty well. I, it's pretty much across the board. Um, you know, the inflations may the the valuations may not be as bloated in the life sciences area as in other industries, but kind of across the board for technology and and life sciences, um, the markets the markets solid. Excellent, excellent. 
I'm going to open this question to you both. It's one that the center cares passionately around and is doing a lot of work in and also has been reflected in Q&A coming in live. Um, diversity of founders receiving capital is not exactly fair and just as we all know, our women and our underestimated talent continue to sort of struggle in gaining access to capital and dollars. What are you seeing that's either inspiring or how do you continue to sort of help think through that challenge and that dichotomy right now um, that exists in the marketplace for our diverse founders to secure capital that's needed? Are you seeing trends going the right direction there? Are you seeing more emerging GPs in this area? Anyone have any thoughts that they can share around that topic? Sure, I can go quickly on that. I, I, I think, yeah, our, our trends in the in the right direction incrementally, they're not, I wouldn't say right yet. There still is quite a long ways to go. Is it encouraging? For sure. It's definitely on the emerging GP side, we're seeing more of that, seeing more obviously than LP capital is willing to support. So that's, that's trend-wise very good. Uh, and kind of companies and, and fundraising and, and those kinds of things, still ways to go. I think the, the, the one kind of feedback and what we try to incorporate is, is understanding that, 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 you know, diverse founders present differently. And, and, and that's one of the things I always try to give us feedback. Maybe I should have done that as my one point of feedback is for those diverse founders who are out there and, and, and to, to be kind of willing to, to speak up and, and be willing to kind of have that kind of confidence that others seem to just have naturally uh, or, or kind of seem to have that, uh, to be able to be that kind of bold and, 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 and you know, to, heeding Craig's advice of don't overdo it and don't over-exaggerate, but you can be bolder. And, and, you know, it's something I've had to deal with culturally, you know, in my career as well as learning to kind of speak up and, and find myself deserving to both have the, the place to speak and the, the, the kind of the time to speak and, 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 and know that you have that place and, and not need to earn it from somebody. Maybe. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with YB. I, I think the trends are in the right direction. I, I think it starts with consciousness and awareness in the VC community that there is a problem. And I think there is a recognition. I, I don't think any venture capitalist would deny that there is a historic problem in venture where money goes to people who tend to look the same, who tend to look like the investors. And um, so there's now an awareness of it and, and there is a desire to change things. A lot of venture funds are requiring diversity and including in term sheets. And I, I have a number of clients that have signed term sheets that have requirements for diversity in hiring on a going forward basis. So there, there definitely are positive trends, but it's early and there's, there's still a lot of work to be done on that front. Um, so right trends, but we, we gotta keep pushing. Gotta keep pushing. A thousand percent, a thousand percent. Thank you both for being champions on that cause and, and continuing to lean in and, and, and help us learn more about what's going on in, in, in terms of optimism and next steps. Um, when we look at corporate venture funds, what are you seeing as far as participation there? It used to be that they were thought of as deploying even more dollars perhaps than, than venture firms out there. Does that continue to be true as far as what you're seeing as syndicate rounds or, or deal terms in general, Craig, YB? I mean, Craig maybe has more on the ground. He sees probably more deals close than I, I do. But anecdotally, it's not as crazy as past sort of cycles where you saw a, just a glut of corporate VC. And that may be because they're just not able to get in the door because there's just a glut of capital in general and the, you know, the, the, the tigers and fidelities of the world flooding down, particularly in early stages. There's just so much capital that the, the bar for it, it used to be, you, you'd kind of see if, if corporate funds were just pouring capital in the market, you'd see them in more and more deals just by virtue of volume of capital but right now this it's capital is infinite and so i i can't tell if if it's lack of effort or or lack of presence yeah I, I would agree with that i mean there definitely is corporate vc activity and and we have plenty of deals um where corporate vcs are involved uh as strategic investors but not like 99 1999 where every tech company set up a venture arm and actively push to invest and we were seeing them lead a lot of rounds. We're, we're seeing participation, but I, I, I totally agree with YB that the, the later stage funds that typically used to invest in public companies started investing in late stage private rounds and they're going earlier and earlier and they're, they're squeezing out not only the corporates, they're squeezing out a lot of the traditional VCs in part because they're willing, they have to write such large checks that they're willing to pay high valuations just to convince the companies to take these $100 million checks. Mm -hmm, mm 
Well, Craig, NYB, I'm looking at the clock and I can't believe an hour has passed so quickly with you, but thank you incredibly so much for the great conversation, for the insights, for the thoughts, for the data. We live by data, Craig. We love it every time that these releases and it is quite literally hot off the presses. So all of you get early access, I say early access, first access, uh -huh. let's at least call it that, to the report. Please click that link, make sure you get it. And then one final ask from us, feedback is our gift. It helps us get better. It helps us make sure that we're really driving forward resources that matter for our entrepreneurs in today's day and time. So please take a moment to complete that feedback. And again, to our amazing guests, thank you for your time, for your generosity. And we will look forward to welcoming everyone back here soon for an upcoming program. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everybody.